today, when we talk about you know, students with psychiatric disorders, we're going to talk about the symptoms of some of the most common psychiatric disorders that we see on campus, um, the academic impacts, suggested accommodations for on-campus and online classes, and um, this is interesting. I'm going to put a positive spin on it and try to look at some of the untapped strengths of each disorder. And so we really, I, I want to try to draw out the positive aspects of some of these disorders to just not only focus on just the negative stuff. So I'm going to try to balance that out a little bit. Um, I'm going to basically email everyone the PowerPoint for this. So don't, don't worry about having to take stuff down because I'm going to email all of this to you. If you went ahead and signed in with Ginger up front, we're going to give you a PowerPoint of this right afterwards. And um, Ned is kind enough to videotape for us. Thanks, Ned. So for anyone that wasn't able to attend today, this should be available on the faculty development website in the next couple of weeks. So perfect. The, the, five, the five major disorders that we're going to look at that are psychiatric in nature are the ones that tend to be the most commonly seen on this campus and commonly seen on other college campuses too. Um, we're going to cover um, generalized anxiety disorder, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So those are sort of the five that we tend to see on campus here a lot. Um, when we look at anxiety, this is a really interesting first-hand perspective from YouTube. And this young lady describes her experience with anxiety, and I think she probably gives one of the best descriptions I've ever heard of it. I'm not really a big fan of the TV show Glee. On it tonight, they're going to do a boring Is that okay? thing. Like, you know, the song by Lady Gaga, everybody knows the song by Lady Gaga. And it's like, yeah, I was born this way. And it's like pride about who you are, and la la la. And uh, they're going to sing it on Glee tonight, and everybody has shirts. And they're about, it's something about themselves. Uh, but I really like Emma's. Emma is the guidance counselor who's kind of, you know, she has OCD, and so her shirt says OCD, and I really like that, and I wanted it, uh, but OCD, while I have it, is one of my biggest things, so I decided to make one out of my biggest thing that nobody understands what it is, and that is this, which is GAD. GAD stands for Generalized Anxiety Disorder, which is something I have really badly. Uh, a lot of people who are hopefully watching this know me in real life and go to school with me. I know those people would know that a lot of the times I'm not there. And you know, I've gotten a lot of crap for that. And I get jokes like, huh, I think you're faking, which just really kind of bugs me. And it's not only because of the anxiety, a lot of it is actually because of my pain disorder. I have fibromyalgia. But one of the biggest things I have is a generalized anxiety disorder, which is kind of what it sounds like. I'm going to try to explain it because many people, I I assume, would hear the name of it and just think, oh, anxiety, well, I get bad because everybody has that, blah, 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 blah. Like, oh, I've heard about depression before. Like, well, everybody gets sad, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, no, no. Okay, so I'm going to try to do this. I woke up feeling like this. Uh, I get panic attacks a lot. People with generalized anxiety disorder can normally do. So I woke up this morning. And you know the feeling you get when you get in trouble? Whenever I get in trouble, I have this feeling. And my heart beats really quickly, and I can feel it throw my entire body. And I almost feel it try to like escape through my throat, I guess you could say. I feel like pressure. And my whole chest really feels like this black hole, and everything's collapsing into it. And I, my lungs are just not capable of holding that much air. I try to breathe in. Slowly, I just like can't. Uh, it feels like I've been running or something. And then I get really, really hot. I'm really hot right now. I get this a lot. I mean, physically, it's not just an in your head thing. People are like, no, it's just in your head. I mean, the root might be, but you feel it everywhere and it does not feel pleasant. A lot of physical crappy stuff going on. And one of the worst parts of it is that you don't know where the hell it came from. You just get these inexplicable feelings of danger. You don't know why. Nothing happened specifically, necessarily. You're just terrified, and you don't know why. And one of the other big problems with that is that because you feel terrified, you go through your head what could be wrong, and then you find things, and then you get more freaked out. And a lot of the times, people with all kinds of anxiety disorders, including OCD and phobias and stuff, we know that it's totally irrational. We know that our fears and all of that are totally, we know that they make no sense. We know that whatever we're afraid of isn't going to hurt us or whatever, but it's the physical feeling.
feelings that we cannot change. Really, I think that the biggest fear of, that a person with an anxiety disorder has is fear itself in the form of a panic attack. I do everything I can not to get them. Really, they're... So, as we can see, there's a lot of, well, anxiety around generalized anxiety disorder. And if we look at the exact symptoms, it always wants me to right click this one. There's, there's a lot of excessive and persistent worry associated with generalized anxiety disorder. And we're not talking about anxiety that's just normal everyday worrying about something. This is, is what's called clinically significant anxiety to where it's posing a significant impact on people's functioning in their daily lives. Um, with generalized anxiety disorder, a lot of people describe their worry as, quote, paralyzing, to where they're not able to sleep at night, they're not able to function, they're not able to go to work or go to school because they're just worried about everything. Um, I've had some, some clients in the past, I used to work in a mental health facility, describe it to me as chain worrying. One worry would spawn another, and the next worry would spawn another worry, so it's chain worrying for them. Um, Generalized anxiety disorder is pretty, pretty intense for people who have it because there's a lot of physiological symptoms along with it. I don't know if any of you guys have ever had a panic attack or been around someone that had a panic attack, but there's a lot of, of sweating and muscle tension difficulty breathing associated with panic attacks. Typically with generalized anxiety disorder, there's that excessive worry sometimes combined with panic attacks. And so it's, it's pretty distressing for people that experience it. <coughs> When we look at the academic impacts in the classroom, there's trouble concentrating and focusing, especially if they're distracted by worrying, um, unpredictable panic attacks, uh, sometimes some social withdrawal and isolation, especially if the person with anxiety feels like other people don't quite understand what they're going through, and also um, the potential for missed classes, um, probably related sometimes to those sleep disruptions where if someone's staying up all night for three nights worrying about something, they're probably not functioning very well the next day in school if they show up. These are just some suggested accommodations and, and what I'm calling success strategies for people with generalized anxiety disorder. Um, some of these <coughs> suggested accommodations and strategies will apply to people that are on campus and some of them will apply to people that are online and some of them are, are both. Um, the extra time on exams really helps students with generalized anxiety disorder because of the focusing issue. When they're worried, they can't concentrate. When they can't concentrate, they can't finish that test in the 30 or 40 minutes that's, that's allowed for it. And so the extra time on, on any, like a timed assignment is really helpful for them. Um, also permission to record audio lectures um, is really good because if they're distracted, that tape recorder is there to back them up. Um, another thing that we sort of discussed in yesterday's session was reasonable flexibility in coursework deadlines and attendance policies. That's a really big word, reasonable. What's reasonable in Dr. Baker's history class may not be reasonable in Karen Job's English Comp 2, simply because of the sequencing of the course and the course material and how rigorous the syllabus is. So when I say reasonable, that's got a lot of latitude behind it, which I really leave up to you all as instructors to determine that. Um, Dr. Baker may be able to give an extra three days to complete an assignment based on his history course and how it works, but Karen Job may only be able to give three extra hours for an English Comp 1 paragraph, if, if any. So everyone's going to be a little bit different, every class is different. But some flexibility, whether it's 10 minutes, three hours, three days a week, is, is better than nothing. This is something that quite a few students with generalized anxiety disorder have sort of come to me about where they have concerns about being called on in class. And while I tell them, you know, I can't stop your instructor from calling on you as a special accommodation. And really, why do we want to not call on you? We want to hear what you think. We want to engage you. Some things that, that we might want to consider is if you have a student that tells you they have anxiety disorder and if you know that they're anxious, it might be helpful for them to get a heads up the night before in the form of a quick email to say, hey, I'm going to call on you tomorrow. I want to know what you think, so please be ready to be called on tomorrow. Um, and if that's something you feel comfortable doing, that may be helpful for them. 
A lot of students with anxiety are so concerned with the unknown and when they can plan things out and see what's in front of them, it reduces the stress. Um, small group work and peer support is really crucial, certainly not only to non-disabled students, but I think it really even goes a lot further for students with disabilities that can be marginalized and alienated in a lot of ways. When, when small group work and peer support is encouraged in your classes, it validates that student with a disability's feelings of, hey, I'm okay. I can work with other people, I can help them, and they can help me. Um, and when I suggested that we pair the student with what are called appropriate matches, I'm basically trying to prevent a situation where a really delicate student ends up being with the bully from Back to the Future, for example. And I know you guys would never do that on purpose, but if you know there's a student that's a little bit delicate, try to pair them with some super nice Julia Childs type people, if that makes any sense. Um, I know that you guys already notify your students in advance of any changes on the syllabus. For the student with generalized anxiety disorder, it's really super important that as soon as you know something is going to change to tell them. Because it's that um, unexpected change that I think really sets them off. And so whenever there's advance notice of something, they can plan it out and figure out how they're going to handle it. Um, if you're an academic advisor like Roberta and Lynn are, um, sometimes it may be advisable for some students with psychiatric conditions like anxiety to take a reduced course load if at all possible. I know it's not always possible. We have several students that say, well, gee, I would love to take six hours, but the conditions of my scholarship and my financial aid package just don't allow for that. So I think we could open up the dialogue on the academic advisement side of, was it really necessary for you to enroll in 12 hours? Would you feel better if you took nine to sort of start that dialogue and see what the student decides? This is my favorite part, looking at the untapped strengths of each disability. And I had a lot of fun actually sort of brainstorming what are some of the strengths here. Um, I know it's an odd question, but if we had to look at some of the strengths of someone with generalized anxiety disorder, what might that look like? They'll know what a deadline is. Yes, <laughs> you're right. I would they much will. rather have that. Yes. The ones that, oh, wait, wait, you mean, what? you <laughs> meant that? <laughs> yes, they know when the deadline is. That's right. Good call. Anything else? That was a good one. They might be up for three nights worrying about the deadline, but they know what it is. It's true, it's true. They can be super detail-oriented, like Dr. Weaver is describing. They typically have a lot of high standards for personal success and achievement, and that's where the anxiety comes in. I want to be up here, but I'm anxious because I'm one notch below and I'm, I'm a failure. That's sometimes the mindset behind people with generalized anxiety disorder. There's this pressure to succeed, and a lot of anxiety surrounding getting there. Conscientious, they know when that deadline is. They're worried about it, but they know when it is. And they typically have pretty good self-awareness of their behaviors. Uh, like that young lady in the video, she knows what's going on, she can describe it. For some other students with different psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, which we're gonna talk about, sometimes there's not always that good self-insight. Um, by the way, I do have a student who has really severe generalized anxiety <coughs> disorder. And the uh, profession she's chosen is a perfect fit. It's accounting. Oh. Oh. It's, yeah, and I'm not being sarcastic, I promise. Oh, yeah. um, but it actually works very well for her because she sweats every detail, she's very conscientious, and she has a lot of high standards. And you know what? That's exactly what the IRS wants to see. Right. <laughs> when someone does for me. Um, I can't. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was wondering if you could actually include advice, the advisors of these students in their information that you share just so we kind of know how to help them? I can't tell you the name, but I will tell you she's in your division. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a <laughs> Yeah. Oh, duh. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, okay. But uh, anyway, I was just thinking if that might be able to help us instead of pushing a 12 hours or, you know, not pushing, but, you know, instead of just to understand where they're coming from. Sure. You know, sure, sure. When, they, when they start having a problem. I can definitely share this with the team. Okay. For sure, for sure. But this young lady, she is like picture perfect generalized anxiety disorder, but she's really made it work to her advantage. So that's really good for her because she really kicks butt on those IRS forums because she knows exactly what to do. She knows exactly what to fill out. 
-hmm. So she's making it work for her. Accounting students are the best ones to advise. <laughs> because they know how to do it. You don't have to do it. They do. <laughs> So depression. This video is um, from a young lady who is actually undergoing ketamine treatment. It's sort of an experimental treatment that some people are choosing to try when traditional antidepressant medications are not working for them. Um, there are some psychiatrists out there for their patients, they found that small amounts of ketamine have actually helped their patients reduce suicidal thoughts. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, ketamine is a veterinary uh, anesthetic. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's typically used for cats, and it's not, it's in some circles an illegal recreational drug. But some psychiatrists are using it in very small controlled doses, or do, do, doses for like human use for treatment of depression. It's controversial, it's not a really widely accepted thing, but this young lady is apparently trying ketamine treatment and she's chronicling her experience while on the ketamine treatment. And she's doing it under the supervision of a medical doctor. But ketamine treatment is not common by any means for depression. The standard treatment for depression is medication in terms of antidepressants. And those work well for most people. But for that, uh, forgive me, I'm just making this number up. For that 5% that don't respond well to traditional medications like antidepressants like Zoloft or Paxil or um, I want to say Zeprexa, but that's an old name. Um, some people are choosing to undergo ketamine treatment. So this young lady is basically telling you about her down point when she's really, really depressed. This is what it feels like for her. Hey, guys. Just want to check in. Um, I can't get out of bed today, so I wanted to show you this. As what I talked about in one of my previous um, videos. This is how a depressed person looks in bed. Um, sorry about the hand there. Um, but I literally feel like I am too heavy to get up. <coughs> I feel like I'm, someone's like pushing at me, like I have bricks on me that are pushing me into this bed. I am so tired, but I can't sleep. Um, anxiety in my stomach. I don't know if some of this has to do with the um, <clears throat> ketamine uh, treatment Wednesday. I, I cannot wait to get it because I cannot take this anymore. Just my whole body feels like crap. I feel like crap. No motivation. Um, get like just exhausted and I didn't even do anything. I mean, I did nothing to be feel like this. I took my dog out and fed her today. That's that's about all I could do. Um, and there's things I need to do today and I just I cannot get up. I just don't want to move. This is what it looks like and as bad as I look I feel about a bazillion times worse. For some people with very severe depression, that's what it feels like to them. Um, how, many, how many of you guys have known someone with depression in your family? Okay, so you, you've known someone that actually had it. Um, did they describe similar feelings to that young lady? Okay. Um, with depression, there's a lot of lethargy, there's a lot of feelings of hopelessness and extreme fatigue. Um, a lot of the students that I see that tell me they have depression, when I try to give them advice about what to enroll in, I really try to ask them how they feel about online classes. Simply because if they're depressed, an online class may be a better fit for them than an on-campus class that they have to be there twice a week and be on and ready and ready to go for. Um, certainly, if they decide to do online, that's, that's their choice. And if they decide to do on campus, that's their choice, too. But sometimes um, online classes work really well for students with depression because it allows them more flexibility. If they're in bed for a day, they can log on, hopefully, the next day and try to get caught up without the worry of, I've missed class. Um, sometimes they'll take that advice, and sometimes they don't. Um, 
with depression, there's um, sometimes when it comes to the sleeping habits, some people will sleep too much and some people will sleep too little. So there's a lot of variation in at least the sleeping habits. Um, and in terms of appetite changes, it's that same fluctuation. Some people will eat too much to where they gain weight a lot, and some people will barely eat at all when they're depressed. Um, but depression, um, it's really got that extreme fatigue and lack of energy in common with the symptoms of, of all types of depression. Um, depression is, is one of the most challenging disorders to work with from a therapy standpoint. Um, and Anne, maybe you've got some experience in this too, because usually doing therapy in, in terms of counseling takes energy and a feeling of self-worth. And with depression, you just don't have that momentum. And so it's really hard to sort of get someone from depression out and moving and looking forward. When it comes to academic impacts, we see the same trouble with focusing and concentration um, as with anxiety. And it's a little more challenging because they've got that lack of energy and motivation. A lot of depression, well, it, it's pretty much in the literature that depression is a neurochemical right. type of thing. It's not a feeling, it's not a mindset, it's an actual chemical imbalance. And when it's there, it's really hard for people to function. But most of them are actually, I mean, most people with depression are there in class. Most of them are not the ones staying home. So right. how do we, and how do we deal with the people who are there in front of us? Mm -hmm. But I guess they're not engaged, or they... Well, this isn't to say that people with depression can't, you know, certainly can't be in class and participate. I, I, the people that have depression are in, and the, are like in class are probably well medicated. Okay. Well managed with medication, I guess, is a better way to say it. Um, I think the people that are super severe um, either are not working and are not in school or are doing things online. Okay. That's typically what we see. So if someone's in class with you, usually, this is just broad strokes usually, they're usually pretty well managed with medication. Okay. Um, and we'll get into classroom stuff in just a second too. Um, with depression, we can have a lot of unpredictable episodes. They may be better one day and then downsliding the next and then back up a little bit later. Because of depression's a chronic thing, some days are better and some days aren't. And also for people that have been on the same types of depression medication for decades, sometimes it'll work for them for a couple of years and sometimes all of a sudden it will just stop. And then their doctor has to work with them to find a new medication that's a good balance of minimal side effects and an effective uh, symptom mitigation. So it's really challenging to find that right balance of medication. Just because you found it once doesn't mean it's not going to change on you later. Um, the same types of suggested accommodations uh, are, are here for depression than they were for anxiety. Just because those same types of accommodations help a large variety of people. Um, certainly, as course instructors, you know, you're going to have to decide, and we're going to have to decide to, you know, together, what accommodations are appropriate for that class. But this is just general suggestions for accommodations in different types of classes. Um, when a student has depression, it's really also helpful for them to work ahead if it's permissible in that class because it provides them a little bit of a safety net during depressive episodes. When they feel better, they can work ahead and get things done. And then so if they do have a depressive episode for two days, hopefully they're caught up from having worked hard the couple of days before. Does that help a little bit with your question, Dr. Weaver? Yes. Or yes. tell me if it doesn't. Send out an email encouraging everybody to work. Yeah. That's, that's a really good way. And I think it helps the student with depression not fall behind. With depression, it's important to generate as much momentum as possible, emotional and academic, because I think it keeps them buoyed forward. Um, certainly with engagement, um, I, it's funny, I kind of asked the disability services coordinators at other schools kind of what they thought about people with very severe depression in class in the sense that do you encourage a lot of engagement with that student or do you sort of leave them alone as they're indicating they want to be left alone. I got 50-50 answers. Oh, no. Some of them said, you know what, they're giving me the message they don't want to be engaged and so I leave them and I respect that. Others said, no, the more I leave them to their own devices, the more I feel like I validate their feelings of self-worthlessness. So um, you make that call in the classroom, certainly, what makes you comfortable, but I think my humble philosophy is we, I want to encourage the student to be engaged no matter what. If they're on campus, if they've enrolled in school, they're telling us that they want to do something different. 
And so I think that we need to sort of honor that engagement. Mm -hmm. um, I do encourage engagement even with the most depressed student in the back of the room with a, a hood over their head because mm -hmm. when we leave them on the side like that, I feel like it validates their own perception of being worthless. Yeah? Would this be an instance in which communicating with a student on the comfortable being called on would be appropriate? I think that would be great. I think that would be great. Because when you ask them, it shows them you're interested in what they have to say, but you're also respecting their boundaries. Yeah. That seems perfect. Yeah. And that way, if they say no, at least you've given them the chance to work through that answer for themselves. But, you know, I really, if, if I was that student, I would want someone to engage me. Definitely. Um, with small group work, again, very helpful for people, especially with depression, because there's so much isolation with depression. When we can get them out of that shell and have them work with other people, it breaks them out of that shell and I think sort of helps to, to heal that feeling of, of, of hopelessness and worthlessness when they're with a group and contributing. So for untapped strengths, what would that look like? I know this is a tough one. This, is, this was tough. I don't mean this sarcastically at all. They're typically well behaved during class. Seriously. We all know there are talkers sometimes that talk over the instructor, texting with people, setting dates. Fortunately, the folks with depression are usually a little bit quiet. And that's something that's good. And I think we want to look at that. <coughs> They're typically very introspective. And they can be sometimes very thoughtful and sensitive folks. Also, I thought this was pretty interesting. There's sort of a rumor in the art community that Pablo Picasso painted the old guitarist when he was in a depressive period after his friend committed suicide. So, and that's regarded as one of the most treasured works of art from that time period. So I think it's pretty interesting where if that's true, Picasso sort of took that um, depressive feeling. I don't want to say energy because there's not a lot of energy associated with depression, but he channeled it as something that was actually quite positively regarded now. So I think that's... Like artistic tortured souls? I guess so. Cliché, but effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. So who, who else? I mean, I, I wonder what other great artists out there were depressed. I think maybe Jackson Pollock? He was the guy that cut off his ear, right? Yeah. He may have had other things going on, too. <laughs> I don't know. More than we have scope to cover in this yeah. session. But you know what? That's a really good point. Maybe the tortured artist uh, you know, archetype is, is really drawing on something over there. So, yeah. <coughs> um, bipolar disorder is pretty interesting. This is a video. It's Canadian and really funny. So, sorry if it's a little funny. I think it's like a student project, but it actually says some pretty interesting stuff. What am I doing? I'm concentrating on my school. A simple thing thousands of students do every day. But for 1% of Canadians, this remains a challenge because they got bipolar disorder. I think it's, it's like 2% United States. Type 1, type 2, and cyclophemia. Bipolar can cause a person to experience an extreme shift in their moods. Courtney Allison, a third year student at St. Clair College, has had type 1 bipolar disorder since she was 17 and says it affects her education and daily life. Dealing with bipolar education, it causes a lot of difficulties, um, especially if you're in a depressive state. In that case, you are have low energy, no very depressed mood, no motivation, and to actually get to class is very hard because of the lack of energy and motivation. Um, if you're tearful in class, it's hard, hard to focus. You get people get some distractions. Um, if you're manic. You sometimes can't pay attention because of your oil mile in a minute. My medication actually helped me to stay focused, concentrate. It also helps me with <coughs> anxiety and be able to do public speaking, um, presentations in class. Um, it's, <clears throat> uh, it works for it works well for my mood swings, so they're not so severe, and I'm able to be more in control of my actions and behaviors. Someone is going through a hard time with their bipolar. Um, they should be able to come with their professor or their coordinator and let them know that they are, in fact, bipolar and they do have some, they do have some issues with that. Um, basically, they need an understanding of bipolar and how it affects their education. Sheila Gordon. Okay. 
Bipolar disorder is pretty interesting because there's so much variation with it and there's so many ups and downs, literally. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with what, what bipolar disorder is? Okay, good, so many people. Um, bipolar disorder, it's a combination of states of mania, which is feeling very up, getting a lot done, productive, um, sometimes to a fault, though a lot of folks who are manic can have racing thoughts an inability to focus on things, and a lot of impulsive behaviors. Um, that alternates with states of depression, sometimes as bad as that young lady in bed in the video that we saw earlier. So bipolar disorder is an alternation of weeks of mania, typically combined with weeks of depression. And so if you're in class and you're seeing someone who's doing really well one week or two weeks and then later they're just in a slump and you don't understand what's going on because they're up and down and up and down, that is definitely you know, some, some symptoms of bipolar disorder. With mania, um, mania sometimes can be productive because there's a lot of energy behind it. Um, sometimes to a fault. Um, I've had some folks when I was working at the hospital tell me that they stayed up for five days nonstop painting their house or starting a new business venture when they were in a manic episode. Um, so it's good that there's energy behind the manic episode, but if it's too much, it can really be harmful, especially if the person who has a manic episode is engaging a lot of you know, dangerous or high-risk behaviors. Sometimes there will be spending sprees associated with manic episodes, um, sometimes sexual indiscretions or impulsive business investments. Um, when I was doing an internship when I was in school, we did group therapy with people who had very severe bipolar disorder. And we had one lady where we could always tell when she was up cycling on manic because she'd wear this big purple feathered hat. And one day on break, when, when the group was taking a break from their therapy for like 15 minutes, she went to the furniture store next door and bought $5,000 worth of furniture <laughs> with her credit About card. Minutes later. Yeah, I, she made some fast decisions. Yeah. So she was, she was a character. And when she was depressed, we would know because she'd basically just sit there with the real glassy stare and just not talk and not be responsive to anything. She was a very severe example. When someone is manic and they have bipolar disorder, depending on their level of bipolar disorder, and again, there's some variations with how severe bipolar disorder is for people, um, sometimes they can appear to be doing great in class. They may be really focused, really goal-directed, getting a lot done. They may be very participative in class, um, and they may have great attendance. Or conversely, if they're really in a manic episode having stayed up for five nights doing all of these impulsive things, their attendance may be poor. So there's some variability here. And it all depends on the student and the person and the nature of their bipolar disorder and the severity. So when they're manic, they might be pretty good in class or they might not really be there at all. Um, with the student with bipolar disorder, um, it's, I, I guess the biggest suggestion I can make in addition to the standard accommodation suggestions is allowing them to work ahead. Because it allows them to harness the energy from a manic episode if they have it, and they probably will if they're truly bipolar, and it gives them that safety net and fall back during a depressive episode. So, you know, certainly no one here is encouraging students to work ahead four weeks into the class and focusing on quantity versus quality of learning. But if it's possible for them to maybe work one assignment ahead, that gives them some type of safety for the future, if that's possible. Yeah? Are we lucky to have many, I guess I'm wanting to know, does the medication not work? Or are we lucky to have lots of bipolar students who aren't on medication? Um, and chime in if you want. I don't want to hog oh. the, the glory. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it's both. Um, there are a lot more effective medications for bipolar disorder now than there were, you know, 12 years ago when I was doing my internship at a, at a hospital, for example, which is good. But bipolar disorder is pretty hard to manage medication-wise because 
Um, psychiatrists are always trying to find the perfect fit of medication for their patient that controls the high ups and low downs without making the person feel like a zombie. Because it's really common for a lot of folks with bipolar disorder. I don't know if you've had this experience with people you know, that they say these side effects, I just can't take them. They're terrible. And for some folks, they'd rather have the ups and downs of bipolar than the side effects of the medication. And so if they're in class, that usually means they're on medication. But just like with depression, that bipolar disorder medication could stop working at some point. Their body may adjust, and they may have to try something new. So if they're in class, that usually means they're pretty well under control. But just because something is under control doesn't mean it doesn't flare up every now and then. So, but I think it's both. And honestly, there are some folks out there, and you might have seen this too, some people, regardless, like the highs and, and lows of bipolar disorder, and they don't want the medication. Or they may not have insurance. Yeah, exactly. Some of those medications are expensive. Fun fact, um, lately, the, um, a lot of the medications <laughs> are actually anti-seizure medications. Um, I don't really know why it works that way, and I don't know if a lot of psychiatrists would be able to tell you either, but it um, seems like that lately, anti-seizure medications are very effective for people with bipolar disorder. There's a lot of productivity behind mania if we can keep it contained to where you're getting a lot done, but you're still in that healthy, you know, sleeping eight hours, going to bed at 10, waking up at six, working out, getting stuff done, instead of staying up for five days in a row and exhausting yourself, because that's just asking to go back into a depressive episode. For people that are manic, sometimes their concentration and focus is enhanced, and sometimes it's all over the place. And some people reported feeling more creative during their manic episodes. Like if I don't click it just right. Hang on, sorry guys, let me go back. Are there any untapped strengths when the person is in a depressive state, or would it be the same as a depressive? I, I guess I'd say probably the same as a depressive state. Just have to be there for the person and try to understand what they're going through and, and hope that they can get themselves out of it. Um, man, I'm so upset. Why isn't this video playing? Hang on, let me go to the other side, sorry. I clicked too much. Good. Oh no, come on. Okay. Don't breathe. I know, I was going to say, shouldn't. I feel like I need to walk around in a circle and throw salt over my shoulder or something. <laughs> Sometimes I'm serious with breakfast. Sometimes I have toast for breakfast. Sometimes I have my breakfast on the go. Sometimes I get intrusive thoughts. Throw the glass of water, Johnny. Throw the glass of water in his face. Imagine the water all over his face. We're gonna pick up the glass now. Pick up the glass, Johnny, in his face. In his face. Johnny, throw the glass of water in his face. Come on, get rid of his face. Imagine the water all over his face. Get to the Johnny. Or that time, and you probably don't even notice. Sometimes, I like nothing more than a quiet night in front of the TV. Sometimes, I get really paranoid. 
think someone's following you. Someone's definitely following you. Yes, he's coming. He's dangerous. I think he's really. I think he's out to get you. I'm sure he's out to get you, Johnny. You need to be careful. You need to really care for someone else. You need to stay closer. Stay closer to him, Johnny. Sometimes I just can't decide what to write. Any ideas? Sometimes I get delusions and I start thinking that something's going on around me that's really not happening. <coughs> or that I'm something that I'm actually not. Like a superhuman who thinks he can save humanity and change the world. I was convinced I was some sort of messiah that had been sent down. And so I wrote loads of letters and sent them on to all sorts of people, telling them my vision of how to make the world a better place. See, we're not all dangerous, or violent, as some papers might have to be. There are smaller numbers of students on campus that have schizophrenia versus the other disorders. Um, schizophrenia, how many of you guys are familiar with what that is? Okay. Kind of like um, with that movie, It's a, be um, a Beautiful Mind. Yes, I almost said It's a Beautiful Mind, but that's, that's It's a Wonderful Life, right? Okay, that was wrong. Um, but with schizophrenia, there's a fundamental loss of touch with reality in the form of either hallucinations um, or delusions. Hallucinations are our feeling, hearing, seeing, smelling things that aren't there or um, delusions are basically false beliefs that aren't generally part of a person's culture. That's so important because our culture is so full of false beliefs. That's true. <laughs> and um, is anyone here into Scientology? I, I'm sorry, is anyone here into Scientology? No? Okay. There's some people in the social science and psychiatric community that think that Scientology is a form of a delusional behavior because of what people leave, believe in that. So anyways. I'm not into that, but I just wanted to ask before I said it because I don't want to offend anybody. But delusions are typically false beliefs that are not part of a person's culture. Like for example, with people that believe in Hinduism, one of their gods has an elephant head. And so we wouldn't consider that delusional because that's in their context of their culture. So delusions are typically things that are not true. For example, the government's following me around. Linda Foster is a secret CIA agent. Um, so it's things like that that are, that are not true, but the person thinks it's real. Um, I had a client at the hospital once who, he had auditory hallucinations, so he heard a lot of things that weren't there, and his auditory hallucinations were actually pretty cool. He thought that Jennifer Lopez was talking to him. Aww. I know, and I, I said, and I asked him, you know, what is she saying to you? Because I'm hoping that, quote, Jennifer Lopez is being nice, and he said, she's telling me I'm handsome, that we're going to get married, and we're going to buy a car together, and I'm like, that's great. <laughs> and so I, I felt kind of bad because when he took his medication, he didn't hear her anymore, and so he was lonely. Um, yeah, I know, that was one of, that's a, that's a rare example of like a helpful auditory hallucination. It's telling you good things. It's like your own personal cheering squad. Um, so with schizophrenia, there's that fundamental detachment with reality. Seeing, hearing, feeling things that aren't there, or believing in things that are clearly not true. Sometimes with schizophrenia, um, there's flat affect, meaning there's not a lot of expression or a monotone voice. And uh, there's a really pronounced issue with what's called executive functioning with schizophrenia, meaning the ability to plan things out, understand information, use it in new situations, and carry things through. So for a person with severe schizophrenia, it's really, really challenging for them to realize, I've got an 8 o'clock doctor's, appo doctor's appointment, 12 o'clock class and homework from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. This doesn't really work for them. Um, for people with less severe schizophrenia, they're better managed with medication, and those are the types of students we typically see on campus, the ones that are better managed with medication. For people that are truly very hard to manage with medication, we usually won't see them on a college campus because they're so debilitated that they just can't function outside of a, a care facility, unfortunately. Um, with schizophrenia, there's a lot of that same academic impact as with the other disorders, but people with schizophrenia may have a little bit more issues with memory. Um, and the drowsiness in class, a lot of them are very drowsy based on the medications. Even if the medications work well, 
and you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. They make people very drowsy. Um, schizophrenia medications have improved a lot over the past um, decade, but that drowsiness thing almost never goes away in terms of how good the medications are. They're just always very drowsy in class. <clears throat> So some students may approach you and say, look, I'm not falling asleep on purpose, but my medication makes me sleepy. Um, with engagement, you know, certainly you want to engage that student as much as possible, just like the others. But occasionally, not all the time, certainly occasionally, there is going to be that student with schizophrenia who needs a little bit of guidance in terms of appropriate classroom behavior. And it's perfectly good to do that. Um, I've had some faculty members come and say, you know, I'm not sure how to handle this situation. Should I say anything? And then I'm like, yes, we do need to because in a way we're modeling those behaviors that we want those students to show. So if they're not behaving appropriately, we say, okay, you know what? This isn't the best way to do it. Can I make a suggestion for a better way? And it shows them accountability. So I never want people to be afraid that they can't say to students with disabilities, we need to do this a better way. And it's perfectly fine to do that, and we should. I gotta say, I've had three students identify as schizophrenic. Really? And two out of three of them were just fine. Good. They were perfectly satisfactory students. Good. And 60% is all I got out of anybody. <laughs> so, out of any, out of any you know, class, so only 60% okay. of them are. So they were doing well. Fine. I'm glad they're doing well. I, I That's know, good. I, I got to say that one does not even work. Oh my God. But no, I kept it in. That's good. And it turned out to be I was worried about nothing, right? They were just fine. Good. Some of the um, videos especially are more severe cases, and so there's, like I said, that large range of latitude between severe cases and mild cases. And I'm just so mm -hmm. glad that the folks that you saw were milder. Mm -hmm. That's good. They didn't want to record. They did? Because they yeah. were afraid they would fall asleep or lose concentration. And that, but with that, their grades were fine. Perfect. So. Then everything's working out. Um, again, it's great to let them work ahead if possible. It gives them that safety net if they do have recurring psychiatric episodes. Even the best managed students with schizophrenia or people with schizophrenia may have the occasional setback. Um, sometimes it requires an overnight stay in the hospital and sometimes it requires just a visit to the psychiatrist to get an updated prescription. This is really neat. This guy made schizophrenia work for him. putting your own delusions and, and fears with schizophrenia into your stories, but he's made it work for him. And so, you know, can we change the fact that these disorders exist and people have them? No, we can't. But at least we can try to make it work for someone, make it work to their advantage. And that's why I thought that video was so refreshing. I was like, that's, that's brilliant, absolutely brilliant, that he's writing horror stories and using stuff from his delusions. Um, this is our last segment. I think we'll probably close up around 4.05. Is that going to be okay with everyone? Okay. The 
This is a student project film. Um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, can be the result of a lot of different situations and, and types of stressors. But one thing that's common with PTSD is that whatever event the person witnessed directly or experienced directly involved some type of, of perceived threat to their life or someone else's, or, or a threat to their safety. So PTSD can develop um, as a result of, of sexual trauma or sexual assault. Um, child abuse if they were abused as children or um, as we're seeing quite a bit of on campus PTSD related to military service so um, certainly you know the feelings and an event surrounding someone's individual PTSD is very different but there's a lot of flashbacks that are associated with it a lot of avoidance of similar situations um, for example with that young lady you'll notice that she didn't want to walk through that parking lot anymore after she almost got hit by the car um, in the same vein, I've got quite a few students with PTSD that get accommodations through my office that were deployed in Afghanistan. And when it's hot outside, they feel like that it triggers those bad feelings in them because the heat reminds them of being in that climate when they were deployed. Um, in fact, they try to avoid the heat because it triggers those bad feelings. So re-experiencing events uh, and avoidance are really key in PTSD. So folks with PTSD are constantly feeling feelings of being back in that same place, negative feelings typically, and are avoiding things that remind them of that event. Folks with PTSD can sometimes be very, very aware of their surroundings. We call it hyperarousal or, or hypervigilance, where they're constantly looking at what's going on around me. Am I OK? We see this a lot with military service members who have been deployed because they're constantly watching uh, windows and doors and people around them. Um, I don't know if you guys have had any people in your classes that have had PTSD, if you're in on, you know, on campus classes, of course. But those folks may tend to want to sit uh, against the wall at the very back um, with as little people around them as possible and as much in front of them as possible so they can see everything that goes around them. Um, they typically may not want to sit by windows because of um, if bombs go off, they don't want to be cut by shards of glass. And they typically want to be able to see the entries and the exits of the room based on their military experiences. Um, so that's just an example of at least, you know, with, with military-related PTSD, kind of what they're experiencing. But the, the feeling of hyperarousal is sort of very common with PTSD. If someone was sexually assaulted, 
um, they may be very, very aware of their surroundings and saying, uh-oh, who's that guy? Is he looking at me strangely? And oh, there's this dark parking lot at night. I'm very afraid. And so PTSD sort of takes these feelings and puts them in overdrive. If we've experienced something bad, well, certainly the average person will say, well, I put my hand on a stove and it was hot and I, I took it away um, and I won't do it again. But with PTSD, it's amped up about 50 times. Um, with PTSD, there's a lot of the same academic impacts as the other disabilities with a little bit more complication. There may be a lot of complications in relationships that occur. Um, you know, if people have been sexually assaulted or deployed with the military and experienced traumatic events overseas, they may not want to be around people the way they used to. It may be very hard to adjust with their family members, being used to them being a happy person, um, and now they're just not that same person anymore. So it's a very, very hard adjustment for those around them. Um, they can have sometimes unpredictable psychiatric episodes to where they're doing fine, but then they have that backslide where they're having those feelings again and they've managed it well for a week, but for two days they just couldn't leave their house. And that happens sometimes. Um, sometimes folks with PTSD have a lot of trouble sleeping, and so sometimes their doctors will prescribe medication that they take at night, which tends to make them extremely sleepy in the morning. And for those students, when they tell me they have PTSD and they're on medication, I ask them, okay, so we're gonna rule out that 8.30 class, right? So we're not gonna do that because they're typically not functioning well in the morning. Um, with the engagement factor, um, if they ask for the space, if you try to engage them, with PTSD it might be better to say, okay, I respect that, and then just sort of leave them to their space. This is just my personal untested, unscientific theory, but there may be more anger associated with PTSD than with some of the other disorders because they've usually witnessed something or had something happen to them that was completely out of their control and was terrible. And there's these feelings of anger as a result of it. And so if there's a little more anger with students that have PTSD, if they tell you they need to be alone or please don't follow them if they leave class, they pretty much mean it. And so I think that we do want to engage them when they're there, but be very respectful of that space. Um, and we actually could have like a whole other workshop on veterans with PTSD, which we have had in the past and we will do again, but that's just like a whole other thing we could make another hour of. Um, working ahead is great. Peer support is excellent, as usual. Um, this is pretty interesting. With PTSD, they're very detail-oriented. Some of those students have chosen to um, do a career in investigative or forensic work. Um, some have chosen to be private investigators where they can sort of use their, you know, observant skills that are amped up 100 times to their advantage. Um, and some of them have chosen to go the forensic route, although not everyone's comfortable with that. If they've been in a war zone, they probably don't want to see a crime scene. Um, but this, you know, hyperarousal can really work for people. It's kind of like with um, Monk. That show on USA, he was super OCD, but it really worked for him. Um, and also, there are some veterans that are trying to use their experiences to help others. This is the second Canadian video I've shown you. As is often the case, those who tend to lend a helping hand have been there themselves. That's certainly the case of two former Canadian soldiers. Having endured post-traumatic stress disorder, they're taking that experience to other vets. They are retired from the Canadian military, but now Jim Lowther and Roland Lawless are foot soldiers in a new mission, searching for other veterans who've lost their way. It's just a spiral down towards the street, and that's where we are to help pick them up, dust them off, stand with them. I feel their stories, and that allows me to uh, focus my attention to get them the help they need. And they're making a difference. Hello. Hi. How you doing? Okay. They've arranged a new home for Renee Boudreau, who left the forces when her post-traumatic stress disorder oh, became impossible to manage. Oh, my prayer was flying until I dropped. I just snapped. After losing access to her two daughters and cut off from society, Boudreau was being evicted from her old apartment. That's when Vets Canada, short for Veterans Emergency Transition Services, stepped in. What they did for me means the world to me. They helped me get out of a situation in an apartment where I wasn't comfortable. 
For a volunteer-led nonprofit agency, funding doesn't come easily. A supporter pledging to give a dollar to Vets Canada for every like on their Facebook page only goes so far. Affordable housing. Just as critical, enlisting partners who can help them help veterans. They help build the bridge, and that allows us to offer that tenancy to that individual. For this ex-soldier, Vets Canada is crucial. Well, it's, it's pretty simple to say, well. Rob Dobson's nervous system crashed after a tour of Kosovo. Drug and alcohol abuse followed. He was homeless, eating out of the garbage when he met Jim Lowther. I knew I was going through a rough time. Uh, we always went for coffee. Uh, he talked to me, uh, gave me clothes out of his closet, um, got me in touch with a, a family doctor, a psychologist. Um, he's the reason that I got to go to rehab. Poignant testimonials for a cause that began by accident. So I ran into a friend of mine I sailed with, and he was homeless. And it went from there to, you know, four vets, then it went to 10, then it went to 20. Now we're right across the country. In fact, Lowther and Wallace have struggled with their own PTSD, a curse when their work triggers flashbacks, but a blessing when it helps them relate to clients. We won't judge them, you know, we won't belittle them because they are us. It can easily be, you know, myself, Roly, um, any one of us. During this walk around in downtown. So they've chosen to do something really productive with their PTSD. They're relating their experiences to other people. And kind of like with the CVSS program, a lot of students in that program may have had domestic violence situations of their own, but they're choosing to use that experience to help other people. So it was super fun figuring out what are some of the strengths of different disabilities to try to work off of them. Because I really believe that there are. We just have to bring it out. So do you guys have any questions or anything? You had really good questions, Dr. Weaver. Yeah. For the online students, yes. um, uh, two questions. One question would be, is there a form of not necessarily PTSD, but uh, chronic stress or critical incident stress because we're doing the emergency responder program mm -hmm. um, and the folks that are in my program can be exposed to critical incidents but not necessarily develop PTSD? And is, it, is that a diagnosed level, I guess, below PTSD that, that, you know, there's some information about? Is it adjust, I'm, I'm a little rusty on my DSM, is it uh, adjustment disorder? Mm -hmm. It might be. I don't, I don't even know that it's there in the new one. Oh, in the new one, I don't have the new one, okay. <clears throat> um, do you want to or should I? Do you want to answer her question or should no, I do no. it? Okay. Um, I have not looked at the latest version of the manual for like um, mental disorders, so there may be a change in that. But in the past, in the past one, which was in effect up until May 2013 of last year, there was something called adjustment disorder, which was sort of like I guess a mini PTSD in which the symptoms lasted usually less than six months. And I think <coughs> I'm going to look this up and I'm going to get the correct information and send it to you. But I think when you hit the six-month mark, then it becomes a full-blown uh, full PTSD diagnosis, okay. I think. But, but I, I mean, it's certainly possible. Um, and whether or not it warrants a medical diagnosis is something that has to be determined by a psychologist, a therapist, or a psychiatrist. But it's possible, for sure. OK. And the second part of that question is, how do we recognize it online? How do we recognize? Because, I mean, we have the potential, a lot of potential in my program to have folks with PTSD or some form of adjustment disorder. What are some things that we can look for in their writing uh, and how they answer discussion boards, do their essays that may indicate that maybe we need to reach out to them? Okay. Do you get accommodation letters from online students like we do online students? They would if the student decided to turn it in. I can tell you for sure, I barely have any in your program. I'm hard pressed to think of one. Yeah. But, but that's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I was just thinking of, of ways of maybe reaching out if we picked up on, if there was something that we could pick, pick up, up on, on their writing yeah. and their. I'll tell you what I think, and then, Anne, oh, Anne, Anne, go first. I talk too much. Go ahead. No, no. Um, <coughs> one of the things that is a clue for me is uh, with online students is something will trigger i mean 
they'll participate in discussion boards and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, it's like, you know, this lengthy rant almost. And, and you can almost see that something has triggered that response. Yeah, that's, that's what I would say too. And I think also um, you'll notice that there's a sudden burst of anger, sudden burst of anger where there wasn't before. And when someone's writing something and they're writing, you'll see the same notes of that anger. And if something is really, 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 really super graphic in the way they describe it in like a really gross graphic kind of way, that's a sign too, I think. Yeah. That's a really good question. And the accommodation papers that we receive, mm -hmm. it doesn't say what the diagnosis is, it just says what to do. Right. So how do we, I mean, unless the student opens up to us, how can we be aware of it? Know what it is? Yeah. I think that honestly, you, I don't put the diagnosis on student accommodation letters because I feel like that's a pretty private thing. Yeah. And, and while I document what it is, I document that for every student that gets accommodation letters in, in courses, um, I document <laughs> what they're, bless you disability is, but I don't put it on the letters because I leave that to the student to decide if they want to disclose their specific disability or not. For example, for something touchy like HIV, I don't want to put that on the letter. Um, honestly, if you want to know, just ask the student. There's nothing wrong with that. And if they want to tell you, they will. And if they don't, they'll decline. So I don't put it on there. I just leave that between the student and the instructor to decide if they want to broach that topic or not. And as teachers, we're not allowed to go, we can't go into the files and can't go to you and say, I have a question about the student. You can, but we'd have to show that there was some reason okay. to do it. Like, would it help you to do your job better with them? Would it help you to, to understand them better? And if it would, then I can, then I can yeah, show student, you. You have, a, you have a, an accommodations letter, mm -hmm. but students making like, strange outbursts in class. Yeah. That would be a reason. That would be a, yeah, you're more than welcome to come to me if, if you feel like that it would help you to understand the student better to help facilitate their learning process. I've called, I've called you or written you more than once, <laughs> and I have advice on X student. Yeah, and, and that's great. Help happens. Yeah. Help happens. Yeah, so just let me know, and, and if I feel like that we're asking in a productive way, not just, you guys wouldn't do this. I'm not saying you would ever do this, but if, if, if people are... <laughs> But if people are asking just to ask with no purpose, I'm, I'm a little less comfortable giving up the information. Sure. But if you're asking because this person's acting really strange, I don't, I want to know how to work with them better, that's a very legitimate reason. And our legal counsel says that's perfectly fine. We just have to have a legitimate educational interest in, in why to find that out. But I don't put it on the letters just because I feel like that's a really confidential thing. Mm -hmm. But the accommodations are all, no matter what the, the it's, all the it's all the same. It's, I know, it's very similar because, you know, when we step outside that scope of, quote, reasonability, then I'm really trampling all over the educational demands of the school and rigors, and I don't want to do that. So sometimes accommodation letters are a little boring. Sometimes they say some similar things, but I do that to try to protect the integrity of your programs as much as possible. Because I've had tons of students come to me and say, I want open book tests. <laughs> open note test, and I'm not going to sign off on that. I'm not. I'm really nice when I say no, but, you know, hey, we can't do this, but we can give you more time on the test. And then it's like, oh, okay. So. You do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, these are really good questions. Anything else?